Greetings, Cinema Appreciation Class. I hope you're doing fantastically well. Today I'm coming from you, as you can see, from the set of Guardians of the Galaxy, and we're on actually the ship. Um, I hope that all of you are doing very well. Today we're going to talk about editing, but it's going to be in three different kind of mini lecture parts. We're going to have an editing on the overall layout, which will deal with kind of classical Hollywood editing, which is the standard we're used to. We're going to deal with montage editing that was developed by Soviets. That will be its separate own entity for space consideration. And then finally, we'll talk about editing specifically, how it really leads us to realism through documentary type films and where we are today. Um, so that will be this week is all on editing. Um, welcome to Cinema Appreciation. So let me begin by some of the great moments in editing that shows up on this video here. Sometimes the magic in cinema comes not just from incredible shots, but from bringing two together to yield something more than the sum of their parts. These are the top 10 most memorable editing moments of all time. We'll be seeing most of these later on today as we analyze them. Kicking us off at number 10, the beginning of City of God. Bursting with energy, the very first shots of Cidade de Deo thrust us into the rhythm of the music and the violence of the underbelly of Rio. Jump cuts, repeated action, frenetic montage, and a final bullet time graphic match from life sound like a recipe for disaster. But in City of God, they don't just work, they electrify the screen. Arthur Penn's fateful finale showed us a death unlike any Hollywood had ever seen. The pace accelerates to breakneck speed as a shifting Malcolm and startled flock of birds bring us towards one last glance between mythic lovers before their slow mo demise. Can't reach now. I've got you. Mrs. Thornhill. At number eight, Hitchcock's North by Northwest. When most think of Hitchcock, they think of a stiff British director, the master of suspense. But even Hitchcock wasn't above a little double entendre. And that's exactly what he used to skirt around censorship laws in what amounts to one giant editorial dick joke. But Hitchcock's got more to him than visual puns. In addition to North by Northwest, which has world-class editing all the way through, we'll be coming back to him for one of the most shocking sequences of all time. We'll be looking at this away that they juxtapose two images here later on in the Godfather. Next up at number seven, the Godfather baptism sequence. One of the most iconic intercut sequences in all of cinema, Coppola's Godfather climax sees Michael Corleone securing his place of power by orchestrating a series of gangland killings all intercut with his baptismal vow to renounce the powers of evil. The effect of the juxtaposition is haunting. Through the power of association, we see Michael christened as the new godfather in the blood of his enemies, whose corpses lie motionless in nomine patri et fili et spiritus sancti. Amen. This is what we'll see for the Soviet montage theory in our next section. The historic Odessa step sequence of Battleship Potemkin. There's hardly a more celebrated achievement in editing than Eisenstein's Bolshevik propaganda piece. Exemplifying his theory of montage as conflict, the concept of two discrete shots giving rise to an idea bigger and different in their individual meaning. Not only is Potemkin pretty much required watching for Films War 101 around the world, but it's been ripped off, paid homage to, and parodied more times than we can count. And this would be my choice for best edited scene ever. We've already discussed this when we Number were five, at the way we put films Nothing together. Nothing prepare you for the shock of the shower scene, the terror of the knife coming at you, the violence, the nudity. Of course, none of it's actually there. There is no actual threat. Not a single stab on screen or even a single frame of movement. It's all part of the editing that Hitchcock uses to evoke these effects in one's mind. In 78 cuts over 45 seconds, we only see blood washing down the drain, which Hitchcock so beautifully connects with Marion Crane's eye in a final evocative song. We will see this movie later on. This is a surrealist masterpiece called Unchen Andalu or the Andalusian dog. Next up at number four, Unchien Andalou. When Luis Brunel approached Salvador Dali with a story of a cloud slitting a moon like a knife, 
Dali told him about his dream of a hand crawling with ants. Thus became Un Chien Andalou, or the Andalusian Dog, a title that means just about as much as anything else in the film, which is to say, nothing at all. But just because it lacks rationality doesn't mean it lacks impact. The this eyes is the, this is the is bird shocking to this day. Really, the graphic match um, the art for a von Bard film during the surreal slice of entirely through the strange juxtaposition, which just goes to show the massive power of editing. And a beautiful opening montage showing you the violence of war. It's from Apocalypse Now. We will see this later as one of the Counting best down opening shots three, of all time. The opening of Apocalypse Now. Francis Ford Coppola's meditative masterpiece on the horror of war and the human soul begins in striking fashion. A series of mesmerizing superimpositions connects the slow motion memories of helicopter to a ceiling fan and a disoriented Captain Willard. There is hardly a better example of the power and beauty of montage in cinema than this sequence. The ideas of each shot literally building one on top of the next, punctuated by the bass slices of helicopter blade and orchestrated by the stern poetry of Jim Morrison. We'll also be seeing this opening scene as well from Stanley Kubrick's 2001. Talk Next about up cutting is on two, motion. The Dawn of Man Cut from 2001, A Space Eyes. Spanning millions of years in a single cut, Stanley Kubrick's visual metaphor works on so many levels, connecting the invention of tools to the advent of space travel, the flight of a bone, to our liftoff to the moon. <laughs> it is this kind of nonverbal communication that makes editing such an incredible medium, communicating, as Eisenstein prescribed, through the clash of imagery. There's hardly a more iconic match cut than this one from Kubrick's masterpiece, but if we had to pick one, Probably be number one, born to the radio. No driving. It's going to be fun. It is recognized that you have a funny sense of fun. David Lean's timeless desert epic captured imaginations and inspired generations over three and a half stunning hours in massive 70 millimeter widescreen. But there is perhaps no single cut more cinematic than when Peter O'Toole blows out a match and transports us to a magnificent desert sunrise. Perhaps it is his smirk or the deep harmonics of the public air, but something about this cut carries weight, beauty, and the richness of theme. Which is why we think it's the most memorable moment in editing of all time. So what do you think? Were any of these moments less than memorable? Did you find yourself especially... So welcome to editing, and I hope that all of you are doing well. Those are their top 10, and you can determine whether you actually agree that those are the best top 10 moments in editing once we figure out actually how all the different editing works. And so let's walk through the terminology here. Editing, first off, is joining one strip of film to another to create a film's meaning. And so as we talk about shot sequence, the shot as you put another shot next to it, that is really what editing is. Remember, editing used to be literally the idea of cutting and gluing one piece of film next to another piece of film. So the idea of joining. Sometimes you can actually make it radically different. So we go from dinosaur to the modern day world or dinosaur to the ancient world to try to get different aspects of editing. And so some of that's going to be to montage, to assemble, to give us different sensibilities. Um, but others is actually just going to continuation on the next shot. Um, so, and so in editing, we really do want to juxtapose different images next to one another. And the more we juxtapose images in editing, no surprise, we're back on that exact same thing that we saw at the very beginning, where we're going to look at the more you edit, right, the more formalist and abstract cutting is going to be happening, such as what we talked about, Un Chen Andilu, the beginning of kind of not just formalism, which we had seen before, but really of avant-garde filmmaking. Beautiful images about motion, psychology, energy that may not make narrative sense. Classicism, we're going to have the idea, that's the Hollywood style of cutting that we'll see at the very end of class today. It's actually established by Birth of a Nation, one of the best, most racist films of all time. Um, note the formalism we'll see in the, the Russian model is gonna be Battleship Potemkin, which is halfway between classicism and formalism. So this is really what we call the Atour theory right here, right in the middle of those two. Remember, expressionism is right here too. And then realism all the way at the other end where we have real documentary films 
and then recreations of real events that actually take place. So we're going to have a whole range of editing styles that exactly match with what we're doing when we look at film modes already. Now, one of the things we have to consider when we're thinking about editing is the pacing of a particular film. When you look at a pacing of a film, it actually, each genre has their own basic pacing that we're used to. And so here we go. So when we look at slow versus fast moving films, romantic comedies also have 1,000 shots um, in their two hour length on average, which means the average shot length is five to eight seconds. An action thriller averages 2,000 shots and the average length that you're actually looking at any particular shot is two to four seconds. Now note, this is going to speed up the action because if you think about it, think about all the different things you're going to do. It's going to be action thriller, 1001, 1002, new spot, 1001, 1002, new spot, 1001, 1002, 1001, 1002, 1001 in the five, so, that's, so you're constantly looking at different motion that's showing up. In the romantic comedy, look at the difference. 1001, 1002, 1003, 1004, 1,005, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005. So the pacing and the editing in a romantic comic really is slows down on some level. It works because it brings people together. Now, as you do this, one of the things to consider is note how important the background becomes here. When you look at something, look at that image, 1,001. 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005. Not only are you looking at their outfits, you're looking at the bottle of water, you see the beautiful landscape behind, you're looking at the flowers casting over. Now look at this one over here from Indiana Jones. You already know the background, partly because many of you have been to Disney World and seen the epic Indiana Jones stunt spectacular. Now just close your eyes for a moment, and I'm gonna give you two seconds to look at it. 1,001, 1,002. See how the background actually didn't matter because you only had two seconds to look at it versus over here, that four and the three, four, four really makes everything in the background much more important. So the slower the film, the more important that background is going to have to be. Whereas an action sequence, like in the Avengers, we don't have to have a lot of backgrounds that needs to be, we're not looking at the background. We're so concentrated on the main character, we don't see it. And this goes to show not just before, the slow versus fast moving films, but international versus Hollywood films are different too. Note, international films average 800 shots in a film, and they may be two and a half hours. The average shot length then is five to eight seconds, just like in a, a romantic comedy. And Hollywood average now is 1,500 to 2,000 shots, even in a romantic comedy, and each of them lasts only two to four seconds. The background's not gonna be matter. Here, we're really going to concentrate on everything. So everything is going to have to work together. and this. Of course, this is from Rashomon, that composing action. So the movement is going to be much more important in terms of the choreography because we're going to spend so much more time analyzing it versus here, we're just going to have quick cuts everywhere. So, you know, we're going to have it cut like transform that it doesn't matter. Ugh. And it's going to be a very different approach to filmmaking. Now, when we are editing, there are three primary transitions that happen. The one that happens way more often than everything else is the cut. We'll talk about different types of cut. That basically literally is where you cut one piece of film next to another piece of film. You glue them together and go. So you could go from establishing shot like we saw early on with um, when we first talked about how shot sequence works. So those are all cuts. So unless you're just panning in, it can go from um, establishing shot, cut to piece of film. Then we get the wide shot of the entire body to introduce the character, cut and we glue them together and we get medium shot. So we can see the, you know, we're, so they can win the Academy Award for setting, for costume, for makeup. Then we get the cut, then we get the medium close up, head and shoulder shot seen here. So they can actually win the Academy Award for acting. And those are all individual shots, unless it's just pushed in. And then it's still basically a transition. It's just a zoom transition with a moving camera. Remember we talked about that actually as well. So three primary, so cut is going to be the most common. Dissolve, basically the most famous one of all time is this one right here, where you have one image that comes in at the same time the Elmer image. So at one point they're 50 50 and then they disappear. This is generally trying to show you a connection between the two that's very direct. We'll do this a lot to show you psychological kind of impacts, or if one individual's impact directly impacts someone else's. So if we have a serial killer and then you phone and you see the mom's reaction when they realize 
that their child has just been killed. And then finally, the one that is the odd one, and what that Star Wars loves, as we'll see over and over and over and over again, is the white, which is actually taken out of the, the wonderful work of the Japanese director, Akira Kurosawa, who loves the white. And basically, it makes a transition across time and space between people that are doing different things, sometimes the battle of good and evil, um, as we'll see, that's often used in Star Wars. So a standard cut, sometimes just called a hard cut. Note, it's the end of a sequence of frames. So here we have the woman in the shower. Then we see hard cut, right? Then we see all these are hard cuts about what's taking place that's actually in the shower. But note, they're all individual cuts. They're just spliced together. And note, the splicing here, if you remember, was very articulated like this, like in an action sequence, because they were not allowed to show any nudity or breast. And they were not allowed to show the penetration of the knife or the blood or any of the violence. So it had to be thoroughly edited. So remember, Hitchcock's women were very upset because they didn't actually even really get to act. They were just like, oh, scream, ah, in terms of the different sequences. And then they would splice them all together to make the image that happened to show up. Now, the most beautiful dissolve of all time is actually also in Psycho. Besides that hard cut editing, one of the best edited scenes of all time. And note, at the very end of the movie, if we remember from the killing before, we actually have not seen the killer. We've only seen the outline, which appears to be a woman wearing a dress and having a um, female hair only in shadow. We don't actually know who the killer is. And so here's the end where they think they've got the killer and they're gonna use a beautiful dissolve to say, yes, we finally got the killer. He feels a little chill. Can I bring him this blanket? Sure. Feel a little chill. Right. That's the aspect that old people feel. Thank you. No female voice. So we don't know who the killer is. They've gone. Oh. It's sad. That's how an when old person wraps them up. Couldn't allow them to believe that I would commit murder. They'll put him away now, as I should have. Years so is this ago. mom? He was always talking bad. as son and looking and like son to the audience because she's trying to protect like those him. girls and that man. As if or is I this him with mom in his background there, because he's like mentally unstable? Stuck birds. Well, they know I can't even move a finger, and I won't. So just sit here and be quiet, just in case they do suspect me. They're probably watching me. Well, let them, let them see what kind of a person I am. I'm not even going to sweat that fly. I hope they are watching. They'll see. They'll see and they'll know. And they'll say, why, she wouldn't even... Look at that disturbing fly. face. Now watch the dissolve. See how it dissolves exactly right into a skull for the death? And they're going to pull out the car where they're going to find buried bodies. And we still don't know who the killer is. And that's the beauty of Psycho. Is it actually Norman Bates? Is it Norman Bates' mom here? We can't actually tell because is it Norman Bates as his mom in his head, who's almost got schizophrenia as it shows up? Is it his mom, and we only see the visual outpouring of what he th she thinks about her son, um, and that he wouldn't hurt anyone, so she's taking responsibility? That's the beauty of a dissolve, or just when it's really well. And then the ridiculousness sometimes. Now, frame wipes can be incredibly effective, but note how many frame wipes show up there. It is a little on the insane side. We will watch all of it, because you, you can get the point. You can always come back. Look at all these different wipes, making connection between one part of the world in another. You know, generally a film might have one or two, but the fact that nine films, you've got more than a hundred of them. And this is an effect that George Lucas popularizes because he's so fascinated with the effect from Akira Kurosawa, that great Japanese film director of Rashomon, about the kinetic symbolism with the woman who defends his rape that we've seen in the side, and with Seven Samurai, that becomes really our spaghetti western. So note, we've seen his name appear many, many times now. And it will appear one more major time. 
Right, it's almost the go-to when you want to go from world to world. And some of them are crazy. It's not even just a frame line. You know, we've got circle wheel or frame lights that come out. We've got angular frame lights that come off the screen. We have the four frame lights that want to get four different images that come at once. It's too many. So it is a trope that they use in the of Star Wars films. Now, another one that we're actually going to look at is called a cutaway. A cutaway takes the audience away from the main action or subject. You see what ha happens outside. So we oftentimes use this for drama or comedic relief within the process. So a cutaway is basically where you have one character, and here you'll see this particular character acting like a, a complete ass to a parent on the phone, or is it because he believes he's talking to someone else? As you see the comedic effect when we actually play around with the frame or the cutaway. And running. Ah, this is from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, a great How 1980s comedy. Well, we've had a bit of bad luck this morning, as you may have heard. Yeah, I heard, and oh, I'm all broken up. Boy, what a blow. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it's been a tough morning, and uh, we've got a lot of family business to take care of, so if you wouldn't mind, excuse us. Oh, I'd uh, appreciate it. Oh, uh, sure. Yo, I'd be happy to. Yeah, you uh, you, you just produce a corpse, and uh, I'll really slow. I want to see this dead grandmother firsthand. It's all right, Grace. It's Ferris Bueller, old twerp. I'm going to set a trap and let him fall right into it. Uh, uh, Ed, I'm, I'm sorry. Did, did you say you wanted to see a body? Yeah, that's right. Just uh, roll her old bones on over here, and I'll... Take up your daughter. You know that school <laughs> policy. Oh. Uh, was this your mother? Uh, no, my wife's mother. Ed Rooney's office. Hi, this is Ferris Bueller. Can I speak to Mr. Rooney, please? Thank you. Uh, hold. Tell you what, dipshit. If you don't like my policies, you can just come on down here and smooch my big old white butt. <laughs> Pucker up, Buttercup. What? Ferris Bueller's online, too. So here we see the cutaway. When we're going back and forth, we could do the same thing with this music for drama. You'd be talking to a serial killer. You could be seeing one thing and really a serial killer sees something else. So you can have multiple cutaways within the same, the same scene. And that's the impact of cutaway. Right here. We're also going to have the impact then of what's called a cut in. Cut in is when you join two pieces of film, but it's a cut that focuses in generally on a detailed information of the subject. They may get a letter, they may get an email, they may get a text, the killer is right behind you, you need to know it, and you see it, and then the next shot, of course, is where you see the killer, she turns around and she sees it right before it. A very famous one is from The Shining, where um, Shelley Duvall, locked away in this horror film, comes up to, and realizes that her husband is going mentally insane because he's been working on a book, and she sees the book, and here's what it says, over and over and over and over and over and over for pages and pages. All work and no play make Jack a dull boy. And then he turns around and there he is in this kind of demented state. And the film kind of progresses from there. She's locked away with no way to go, but she's got to protect her son as well. Now, we're also going to have a lot of times on cutting on action. Cutting on action, again, is a cut. So it's joining two pieces of film together that otherwise you would not see in natural order. It's a cut that links together two compositionally similar scenes. For example, the imminent pulling of a gun, they cut to a champagne cork firing off. So you go from to get the sound that shows up. And that's something that we're going to see. And so a good case of this is actually in The Matrix, where you have two related scenes that are taking place. I'm going to be honest. And this is a scene we've seen before when we talked about kinetic motion, particularly by the um, wonderful, wonderful choreographer Yun Wo Ping. And it comes up in a little while. So it's the noise and when he starts banging on. Skip two. We won't have. There. Shit! We went right past it. 
right about here. So this is what he's actually starting to shape the head of Neo or of Morpheus to make sure that he gets, he got to have the code. And that banging actually becomes the music for them coming in to do the violence. We will have something called a J cut. Now I will not focus on this, but I just want to make sure that you know what a J cut and an L cut are. A J cut is when you have the sound from the previous cut extends into the new shot. It almost acts like foreshadowing, like you see here in Skyfall. So it's a very effective use of sound. So the J cut is when sound from a previous cut at the beginning of that continues on where you hear the gunshot that comes in, and then they continue on into the comic. The L cut is exactly the opposite. The sound from the previous cut extends into the next shot, as we see here from Fight Club. Now, when we do match cuts, matching cuts are movements, uh, pace of two opposite environments together. So in 2001, we've already seen this cut before, this ape or chimpanzee is going to throw the bone, the first tool mankind ever invented from millions of years ago, showing our evolutionary roots and it's going to convert into our modern day tools to see the world. So that's called a match cut or matching on action. We also have cross cuts. Cross cuts are the idea when we have two different stories that we wanna make a relationship to. So these are all different types of cut. I said that was the most common form of um, cutting out there. So no, we're cutting back between between two different stuff, um, scenes. So we can call this cr cross cut. We also can call this um, intercutting. So if you don't know, this is from um, Interstellar by Christopher Nolan. Or I'm sorry, Inception by Christopher Nolan. Interstellar was also his. But you see how we're going back and forth between two different actions. Right? We're showing that these situations somehow are related. Now we have two fights at the same time going on for control, basically of the dream world versus reality. All right, the most common form that we're going to see when we cut is called cutting to continuity. And so this is simply, and we use this in every film, it's the type of editing in which shots are arranged to preserve fluidity of an action without showing everything at all. I had mentioned this before. Let's say we wanted to talk about what I did today. My life is pretty boring on a daily basis. I got up, I showered, I had breakfast, I helped my children get ready for school, I drove to work, I taught my first class, nothing you wanna see yet. So what do you need from my, my aspect to make sure, let's say something terrible happened at Miami Dade College. Maybe someone gives me Corona, and it's the story of Corona and the spread from Miami Dade College, which has 160,000. So far, all you need from my background is my alarm clock for me waking up, me getting in the car, because you assume he showered, he's a professor, he got into his car, he drove. So you need three shots. You need me getting up, 6 a.m. You need me opening up my car door, and then you need me teaching. You make the assumptions of everything else. Because otherwise, that's four hours of the day that you do not want to see in a 24-hour film. Life moves at a boringly snail's pace till the action happens. That's what cutting to continuity is. And then the opposite of cutting to continuity is where we show you consciously that you're watching film. So this is called discontinuity editing. The conscious experience of watching an art form. 
It denies the suspension of disbelief. And the most famous case of this is French New Wave, Breathless by Godard, um, also on your top 100 list, specifically because of the discontinuity ending. We'll talk about the impact of French New Wave later on as well. Watch how you are conscious. They're having a conversation. Look at her face. So far, everything's normative. Oh, we have a, a weird cut there. A different weird cut in her in your different background. So this is either barely badly edited, so sometimes we'll see, or it's actually discontinuity. They are making you conscious that you're watching a film and not just watching two people from the back of the car. That's what discontinuity editing is. Quentin Tarantino loves discontinuity editing because he also loves the French New Wave because he wants to make sure you're watching you know you're watching a film and not just watching two individuals in real life. So it takes you out of the film going experience to make sure you're like, oh yeah, I'm, looking, I'm watching art. All right. With all of that said, when you put these pieces together, except for discontinuity editing, which is often not used in most films, but really used very sporadically. So remember the three main traditions in any kind of scenes are going to three trains editing traditions are going to be your cutting with all the different aspects of cutting. Cut away to show you what's going on outside the scene, cut in to show you something smaller within the scene like a text or me looking at my computer, um, cutting on action to show two different actions. If I throw a punch, someone moves at the same time, you assume those connections. So all of these different things show up. So you have cutting, you have the dissolve, and you have the white. You put all these together with, along with the motions and the distortions, um, the five kinetic motions, the five distortions that we talked about of slow-mo, reverse-mo, fast-mo, um, animation, and freeze frame, you put all of this together and you can get a beautiful set. Now, the person who puts these all together for the first time, at least in the United States of America, is this individual here named D.W. Griffith. And this is a film that's called Birth of a Nation. This is, might be the most racist film ever because this film celebrates the KKK as the savior of white women. Now, first off, it came out in the early 1900s and we lived in an incredibly racist society. We still have racial issues and divides today. I mean, there are all sorts of studies where if you, if I was to call in and say, oh, John Frazier, I'm calling for a job interview, blah, 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 here's my credential. And I called in, I said, oh, this is um, Letitia Blackburn with the name Letitia. And she called in at the same time. She would get that interview less than half of the time because she has a black sounding name. It's terrible, it's awful, but that is still the United States we live in. So let's not get past the idea that we are not still living in a racially charged, racially um, racist or racial environment that shows up that disenfranchises people that are not white, wet, or wealthy, heterosexual Christians who can look at all the studies within. I have advantages over others. This film markedly said, that's good we have advantages. Why? Because white, wealthy, heterosexual men and women, we're better than everyone. And so this celebrates the foundation of the KKK as the savior of white women, because all black men wanted to do was rape or have sex with these, with these white women as soon as they got their freedom, which could not be farther than the truth. Like we almost make fun of the situation um, that shows up. And yet you can, because this is the first film that was ever screened in the American White House. Sadly, I want to repeat that. This is the first film that was ever screened in the White House. Now, as racist as it is, we have to watch the film because this is the birth of the Hollywood filmmaking industry. This is the film that puts all the concepts that we are talking about so far, about editing and kinetics, all together into making a great blockbuster film. They're the ones that are actually going to use the colored film stocks to set the mood, which we talked about, in terms of coloration when we're looking at mise-en-scene, the blue for night, the red burning of Atlanta, the Verdant Plantation for the, the growth of what was taking place. This film is going to invent or promote all of these things for basically the first time. And so D.W. Griffith is generally referred to in America as the father of film. And he's going to invent what we call classical cutting, Hollywood cutting, or invisible cutting. Cutting so much that cutting the continuity that you do not even notice what you're looking at. He's going to come up with the paparazzi shot, which is the Irish shot which basically starts off a little circle. It's almost like a 
um, a, a white and then it comes out so you actually see what the paparazzi is seeing kind of behind the trees. It's the first time we're ever gonna see Lincoln's assassination on film. We're gonna see the cut in for the first time where you go from looking at like, oh, and then they're reading a letter. So you get to read the letter. They're gonna do chase scenes, which are parallel editing, which is basically you show one scene and then another scene. And yet they slowly, you cut the time that you see each one to show that the sides are getting together. So we're all of a sudden, all of a sudden they're fighting. So we'll have KKK riding on the horse with this triumphant music. Dun, da, 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 dun, da, 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 da. And then we'll have the African Americans that are about to rape a woman. And then they're fighting. And so we have this kind of creation of this parallel city, which is the model for our modern day chasing. They're going to invent title cards written Tarantino later on, chapter one, chapter two, telling you what's taking place. He's going to invent matching cuts. You throw a punch, someone moves at the same time, rather than just throwing a punch, and then the person stands there. They're going to invent eyeline match, which means that if I'm looking at you at this angle, you're going to be looking back at me at this angle. People didn't think, even think about that before. So you might have people looking at you at this angle, then you have a child's perspective looking up at the same time, rather than me looking down at the child and then the child. They're going to invent the 180 degree rule, which we'll look at in a moment, but that's all the cameras are on 180, um, 180 side, so that whenever you're shooting, you're always shooting from this side. Remember, if, you, if we went to the 360, we went over here. As soon as we move the camera past that 180, all of a sudden, if I'm on this side, now I'm over here. If I'm on this side, now I'm over here because I moved the camera so we don't cross that 180 line. We're going to have the first use of professional actors, the first use of color film stocks, the first person who ever uses multiple camera angles, which means you can get multiple cameras at the same time, shooting the same thing so we get multiple perspectives. We can even have dialogue scenes over the shoulder shots, as long as we don't kept the film in it. We're gonna have a shot, reverse shot for dialogue. So I'm talking, now who am I talking to? Now I'm talking, now who am I talking to? So that, and finally these lovely long takes that we're gonna see in romantic comedy for lyrical songs. So here's the 180 rule. No, you don't put the camera on the opposite side as you can see in this particular thing, and this is what your book talked about. So everything looks normal here. Blue person on the right or the left, blue person on the left, blue person on the left. If you go to camera D over here, all of a sudden blue person, and we're consciously looking at, my God, we're looking at a film, right? It's not just really. The only way we generally do this is if we actually rotate all the way around. So you actually see the rotation of the camera around, almost on if it's on a track like a dolly, so you see the entire 360 like you do in later films. We're not up to that kind of technology yet. Now, as I show you different pieces of film, and we'll look at some of these in class, by all means, be wary. This is a racist film, and I apologize, but it is a product of historical importance because it is, is by far one of the one of the hundred most important films of all time. And look, most likely, it's one of the 10. It might even be one of the five most important films of all time. So we're gonna start off with a plea for the film, to take it in seriousness. Then we have Plantation Life, we'll see. The assassination of Lincoln, the founding of the KKK to protect white supremacy, and the KKK as protector of white women. Like, we're talking about some very racist images if the KKK is your superhero figure. So here's the film itself, or pieces of the film. I won't walk through all those. This film is actually embedded in this week's PowerPoint, the entire film of the two hour, or three hours and 10 minutes. So if you'd like to go and watch the entire thing and be entertained, I will mention this film is so racist that this film is actually used when KKK members still become KKK members on the night when they're out celebrating and partying. This is the film that they still watch. Thank you, D.W. Griffith. So here's the plea for the motion picture, basically the title cards that were going to come up. Note, it's meant to be a silent film. Um, and yet there is still background music as we talked about. You know, the references to the Bible and Shakespeare. And we're about to celebrate the KKK. That is some racist BS that we have to deal with from our past and still have to deal with. It's based upon a, a, a novel called The Klansman, so they give you all that information. We're gonna start off with plantation life. So here's life on a plantation. Women taking care of their men, 
gender stereo roles. This is what's happening. As awful as this concept of the movie behind it is, think about the, the photography, the cinematography is actually beautiful. So this is going to be the North and the South, two brothers before the Civil War, coming to greet me. Look at the depth of field that shows up with the photography from the early 1900s. There's our first cut in, just been invented. Never seen it before in film. Right, they're basically saying I'm coming. And they're gonna come, and of course they're cousins. And when they come, here, here's our plantation life. They're gonna take a lovely tour. So now we have the Northerners and the Southerners. Picking cotton, if you don't know. Now, this is also a racist scene right here. Look how happy the slaves appear when the slave master comes. They're supposed to have two hours off to rest in the heat of the day. Look how happy they are that the white slave man master is coming, and they're going to actually put on a show for him and his betrothed. Note the positive music like this is just what they want to do on their time off. Remember, these are people that work in the heat of the day. And you will notice there's a number of individuals that here are not actually African-American or African descent. They're actually, a lot of them are white people in black face with actually black tar on their face so they can poke fun even more at African-Americans. Now look, they get bored with it, with this performance, and they wander off. the African Americans don't continue to dance, they were doing it as a performance, because that's what they were supposed to do. They're not supposed to look that happy about it. Then we go to the assassination of Lincoln, just to show you the various aspects. Note the different colorations. We scroll through. Let's see if it's off. Here we're at the theater. There's the Lincoln box up here. largely because he wanted reconstruction, he wanted to rebuild the nation. He didn't want to exact punishment or the death penalty on anyone that were the traitors to the United States when they actually left the United States. And so it was a blow to the South, ironically, when he gets assassinated, unless you were thinking the idea that we would go back to um, slavery even after it had been outlawed. But he really was for bringing the country back together. He didn't want the war initially. No, here's the guard. This is why we protect the president way better today, as you'll see. You're going to see a couple Irish shots showing up here about the individual who's going to assassinate Lincoln, John Wilkes Booth. You know, he goes from the darkness to the light, so you can see. So that darkness to the light is generally a good action. I know when he does it, that allows Lincoln to get assassinated. So as D.W. Griffith promoting the idea that it's all right to kill, there's the Irish shot right there. So that's the, the killer looking on to try to figure out, oh, is now the right time to take out the president? in the Irish shot there. And even here, he looks a little demonic. So it might be that he actually is thinking this is a negative image as well.
That's like him pulling a curtain, almost as half of his all, so he can actually look out without anyone seeing him. And now he shall disappear. No, he's in the light. Goodness. And now he's going to go high with that darkness. All because the guard left. He's thinking about it, and now he's going to go do it. First time we ever see the assassination of Lincoln. Six Semper to death to the tyrant. And then he runs off. Now in the aftermath, the KKK is worried about what's going to happen. That African American slave, former slaves, might feel the right, the obligation that they can actually exact vengeance and take out, particularly to go and attack white women and rape white women. So we're gonna have the KKK as the protectors of white women as we look at our next chase scene. You know, we're skipping through most of the film. So here we have the Black Army really exacting vengeance and problems. Because remember, in different parts of the South, they do outnumber the white people now. See white women be entertained by African American or by people that are mestizo, mixed ancestry. And so of course, quote unquote, they're in danger. And yet you see how gently they've actually been treated here. So here's our chase scene. So here we have the battles that are starting to happen. All right, peacefulness here together. We've got to protect beautiful white women. Sometimes even from themselves because they can't control themselves with the beautiful African American powerful black man around. But here we have the black army coming to attack them. And who will save them? Who will save the white man in the cottage in rural America? We need someone to protect them. So of course we're gonna have the KKK as the heroes here. As we're about to see. So now watch. To note the positive music as the KK assembles. What's even more amazing about this particular film in the 1900s, so here's that battle scene now that starts to fight out. Right, so we've actually got the two individuals together, two different scenes, and now we're fighting over it. And look how positive they're treated. But the amazing thing is, they did not even have to ask people in the United States um, when they were looking for extras, they did not have to provide extra costumes. They already had their own KKK costumes. So these were costumes that Americans in the South already owned. Look how common it was for them. White, white woman who's about to be damaged and taken by the black man. And so we have the KKK thankfully coming in to protect them, all of us. So if you want to take on modern day and an African American director, watch Spike Lee Klansman, which basically uh, came out a few years ago. Spike Lee won the Academy Awards Best Director, finally um, talked about the black condition, even in the modern day world, which is basically a reaction against this many, 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 many decades later.
And now we got to go save the white woman. And so it's a celebration of KKK heroism. And that's what we're looking at. So the film that we see with all these ideas, and note, he reveals who he is, um, you know, falling in love within the process here as well. So on some level, we are looking at the most racist films, but this is the film that sets the establishment of basically the Hollywood film industry. If you look, when we go back a few slides, I mean, look at this. One film, we have the invention of the Irish shot for the John Wilkes Booth scene, the cut-in scene, the chase scene for parallel editing, showing the good, the bad, and the two stories coming together, inventing tiled cards, inventing matching cuts, inventing eyeline match, inventing 180 degree rule, professional actors, color film. It's hard to make a case that this is not one of the most important films in terms of influence in all of film history. Remember, because when we talk about influence in film, we talk about money it brought in, it was commercially a huge success. We talk about the technical innovations, this lines them up. We talk about the influence on labor culture, absolutely lines this up in every capacity. And aesthetics for more, this was considered the best the foundation of the Hollywood film industry. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. So I'm sorry that we have to you know, talk about all these positive things about a very negative film, particularly when we want to make sure that we understand that racism still exists in the world. So that's what we want to get to. Have a wonderful day. Bye.